Welcome to After Dark at the Fixed Ops Roundtable, featuring Kara Delane and Ted Ings. This episode is brought to you by BG Products, partners beyond products. And now for your hosts, Ted Ings and Kara Delane. Howdy, y'all, and welcome to After Dark with the Fixed Ops Roundtable. Look at this crew, Ted. Do we have technicians tonight? We have all technicians tonight, Kara. And, you know, I almost forgot my hat, so I got it here last minute. But uh, I'm ready for the today. Wild West, Kara. How about you? I'm ready still. Even though I don't have my hat on tonight, I'm ready. All right. Pure Texas girl. We got a bunch of technicians on here. We got the best of the best. And um, by the way, we're live tonight, right? We are live on Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube, so make sure everybody's sharing the video and dropping some comments for our technicians tonight. All right, and you're gonna bring those in for us? I sure will. All right, so we have a big event coming up. Tonight, I wanna uh, give a big shout out to our exclusive sponsor uh, for the After Dark Show. It is BG Products, Partners Beyond Products. And Kara, we are gonna have at the upcoming Wild West, four full days where BG Products is going to be telling us what that Partners Beyond Products means. And yeah. we're going to go into that in some depth. Uh, I got a lot of insight into that this morning, and I'm excited. And uh, a lot of stuff coming at the Wild West. Yeah. So these gentlemen here are going to be on a panel led by the one and only Robert Stage of Stage One Mobile Diagnostic and Roger Koenig. Good evening. And uh, Robert, um, amazing that... Uh, you know, this is your brainchild. Give us a little bit of the backdrop on it. Sure thing, Ted. I want to thank you for having us back on. Um, I just wanted to get together some technicians that I talked to on LinkedIn and uh, have admired some of their work, the things that they write, uh, things that they've been putting together for technicians, you know, basically exclusively, and get them together and kind of talk about where they've been, what they've done, um, what their careers have been like, and then basically, you know, where do we go from here? You know, how do we get to a place where we're getting – more funding put into schools and, and more funding uh, put into like programs where we can actually um, help help children and kids, you know, coming up through middle school into high school to get into this industry. So Robert, do you know Cindy out. Barlow from Wild Tech? I do. Yep. I'm connected. So Cindy Cara uh, came out to the second fixed ops round table in Los Angeles. She was a speaker and Cindy won the second best practice award after Tully Williams. And wow. Cindy is a great ambassador for our industry, for up and coming technicians. Wildtech has an amazing platform. Cindy, congratulations to you. I see Wildtech everywhere and uh, just a great name for our industry. So Cindy Barlow, thank you for all you do. Um, Robert, I'm gonna have you introduce everybody who's on with us tonight. We've got some great talent. Real quick before I do, I wanna get from Kara the dates for that Fixed Ops Roundtable Wild West event. It's coming up quick, Ted. January 23rd, 24th, 25th, and 26th, our first ever four-day virtual event. So if you haven't already got your complimentary tickets, grab them now at fixedopsroundtable.com. Yeah, and I see some of the non-technicians on there, like Ed Roberts and Sarah Van Tyne and Tully Williams and Kara and myself. That is two weeks from today. Uh, it's a four-day event. It's going to start off on Monday. And Owen Moon, happy Monday to you as well. Congratulations on that grandbaby. And, uh, okay, Robert, take us through the intro intros tonight. Sure thing. Uh, up in the corner there, we have Russell Wickham, a 15-year technician, world-class General Motors technician out of Texas. Uh, on the bottom right, um, your left would be Marshall Sheldon. Uh, he's a heavy truck technician. Um, how, how many years do you have, uh, Marshall? 20 some? Uh, uh, 15. 15 also. And then uh, on your other edge there, uh, just to my flank, is Joshua Taylor. Uh, Joshua Taylor is a, um, was it 15 years for you also, Joshua? Longer. You're muted. <laughs> Going on 25. 25. And uh, currently you're a power sports technician. Is that correct? Yes, sir. There we go. Love it. So, Great Robert, guys. you brought these gentlemen together, and um, you had a number of uh, questions that you wanted to make sure that they're going to be addressing at the Wild West event. But I know we're not going to get to everything at that event, so sure. I'm going to let you uh, open that up, and uh, you know, let's hear from the text, Robert. Sure. Uh, one of the first ones that I really like, and it gains a lot of people talking on LinkedIn, a lot of comments get generated, 
is flat rate. Um, I know a lot of the manufacturers really push flat rate because it's an easy way for them to track warranty times. But a lot of times the technician is the person that ends up being left out in the cold, so to say, when it comes to getting paid, uh, whether it's that on warranty time or if it's on customer pay. So I want to go to Russell Wickham first because he usually is the loudest on LinkedIn about it, and I can't really blame him. Um, what are some things that you think that the that the the warranty times and and the manufacturer can do for dealers to really help out with that and mitigate those types of uh, tension points? Um, the the issues that we have is the manufacturer is trying to increase their profit. They they have a requirement by their stockholders to generate profit. And if they're seeing something that is repeatedly showing up, you can guarantee the times are going to get cut. So I think that probably the best way to handle this would be to uh, develop funds somehow, don't have all the details yet, but an independent labor time garage that manufacturers have no control over. They can't just walk in and say, I need, I need five hours off this job because it's costing us too much. They have to go in, present, and then it's actually studied by a garage that does it real world. Um, the manufacturers, they start out with the vehicles already racked. They don't have to diagnose anything. They just bring it in, change the parts, stop the clock. That's what you get paid. And oftentimes the times are not even close to realistic. So, you know, if, if they OEM can present a uh, new procedure, then it gets studied and, and um, the, then if indeed it is a better procedure, then it's published and the time can change. But um, it right now it feels very arbitrary that um, um, things are, are popping up. Um, a recent labor time cut I ran across when they first released the LM2 diesel engine, which is the three liter diesel engine that GM uses. Um, mm -hmm. There was a, a water valve on the side that's electronically controlled. They're having some issues mm -hmm. with it. Uh, labor time on that was 8.1 hours. Um, wow. I looked it up on uh, Thursday. It's now 3.4. And my best time on it ever was 5.3. So, you know, I know next time one rolls in, I'm, I'm losing. Sure. So, you know, I went and I looked at the procedure. Nothing's changed on the procedure. So why did the time get cut? You know, what, sure. what changed? Technicians got a little better at it. Did we really get five hours better at it? You know, so. That's that's why I complain so much about flat rate. I try not to be a complainer. I try to be positive, but um, sometimes when it's when it's hurting that bad, you you do squeal a little. Russell, sure and we, we've heard we've heard a lot of that, uh, Robert, uh, over the last few years on the roundtable. That's been a recurring theme. So you know, kudos to to you know to address it head on. I love it. Sure thing. Yeah, and, and you know, when it comes to complaining about it, I think that, I mean, there's things that have to be brought up. If you want to make things better, you have to be able to take constructive criticism. And I think that's a pretty good constructive piece of criticism for manufacturers and OEMs. Uh, Marshall, back to you over there. What do you think? Uh, is there something that, you know, that you see from your end that, that could be changed? Um, well, I, I have a hard time with the flat rate scenario in general. I feel like a lot of the senior techs that are doing it now they're used to it. They've been doing it a long time. Um, but I feel like we, to get these new techs that are coming in lined out, I really feel like we need to move to more of a hybrid pay structure where we need to show these junior techs that it's a stable, lucrative industry where they can come in. They have the ability to uh, strive to be better and make some money for their families, support, uh, you know, a family, a car, a house, a home loan, a mortgage, you know, those things are really important, and uh, these youngsters are looking towards the future, and we've got to support that. Sure. I can definitely see where that would uh, come into it. I've, I've worked at a couple of different shops over the years, and flat rate and also hourly. And I think the flat rate shops, I think that they overlook that really a technician coming in, even someone that's, that's you know already had their teeth cut and they know what they're doing, really should have two to three months at least of some type of a guarantee when they come in, especially if it's a full-time OEM dealer where they're getting ready to go 
And at that 90 day point, they're going straight into the buzzsaw, so to speak. Um, I think it's beneficial for them to be able to get their bearings, you know, have already went through all their onboarding, all those types of things without worrying about, well, I have to get this done. I think a lot of people don't understand is when you're under the clock like that, there is a huge exponential jump in not fixing it right the first time, not diagnosing Mm -hmm. it correctly the first time, causing problems, breaking parts, breaking brand new parts. There's a lot of things that people don't understand. It's all the different variables that go into that repair. And I think that's a problem uh, when it comes to flat rate in general. Joshua, what say you? I'm I'm different. Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with flat rate. Um, I think it's uh, a completely different set of things. And Ray Hernandez says it's an abuse from the manufacturer level. You know, that's never going to change. You've got businesses are, are there to make money. They're going to do things to make money. They're going to be they're going to do things to make their shareholders happy, so on and so forth. That's that's never going to change. Capitalism is as capitalism does. So it comes down to one of the things that I say as often as I can possibly say it, a mechanic's first job, whatever they're doing is to find a great leader. It doesn't matter what process you're talking about. It doesn't matter what subject matter you're talking about, whether it's flat rate or not. A good leader, especially great leaders, are going to know how to deal with the situation that is representative of their team, their store, their brand, and help make changes or decisions or action steps to help the team. And it doesn't matter if we're talking about flat rate or not, but if, as we are talking about flat rate, you have a system that, like Russell mentioned, you know, it went from, if I recall, 8.3 or sorry, 8.1 8, is what 8. you 8.1, 8.1 yeah. to 3.4. 3.4. So that's an epic chop. So to Russell's point, what happened to make the chop a good or even better, a great leader is going to ask those questions and they're not going to ask like, Hey, what happened? And wait for the response. Oh, we chopped at five hours. No. What happened? Why is the fleet, of, the, the fleet of guys and girls that I have down in my shop, whether it's five or whether it's 50 or a hundred, like Mr. Ed Roberts, who has a fleet of technicians that, if you ch- let's say they do 10 a month, that's 50 hours. Like that's a lot of money. So if, if a great leader goes, something's not right, presses the hard button. They press the hard button. They press the hard button until they get some good answers. And if they have the opportunity, do a, t- do a time study, do a real world time study. It's available to a good leader and a good leader will do it. Great points, Joshua. Um, A couple things. Uh, Ray mentioned in the uh, chat just a couple minutes ago that Illinois law, I'm going to have Len Belavia is going to be on the show. He'll actually be here tomorrow. We'll be talking about that because his company, uh, Len is a a lawyer. He represents dealers with uh, dealerlaw.com. And uh, he'll be talking about that as well. And, uh, you know, so timely. Uh, Ed Roberts uh, is on a number of panels. One of them is on... Kara, the acceleration of change. And that came up today that it comes back to a great leader, Joshua, on the uh, on the retail side and standing up. And, you know, Ed's a great example in probably the biggest shop on the East Coast that I'm aware of. So. Robert. So so to that flat rate thing and and Illinois being someone who came in and said, you know, we're going to stop this and all warranty times are going to be what CP is. Yeah. Me personally, I didn't like that only because I, I'm a flat rate guy. I like flat rate. I didn't realize how much money I was leaving on the table by staying in the aftermarket so long. I was 18 years in the aftermarket. I think my highest pay rate in the aftermarket was like $22 an hour. Well, I went to a flat rate system at a dealership and I already had that time under my belt. And I'm hungry. When I go there, I want to take, I want to eat everyone's food. I want to take all their money. That was my whole goal was to do it right the first time and get as much money as I could. I used to call it making lawyer money. It's like if you can do four hours in two and do it the right way and it goes away and you get good CSI, who cares how long it took you? You actually put double in your pocket and the dealership's happy because you can go to the next ticket. But I don't like having government step in and have to try to fix problems when good negotiations on both sides could have probably come up with something that was similar to that without passing a law. So that's how I feel about it. But to to Russell's point, I definitely understand and feel that the the hybrid system where it's, you know, you get 30 hours guaranteed and then everything over that that you make, 
I think that's a happy medium if they were to ever move to that. Interesting. Robert, you had a couple more questions, I know. I have all kinds of questions. How long do we have? <laughs> so 13 minutes. <laughs> 13 minutes left. So let's go to um let's go to how can places grow their own techs? What can they do? What resources do they have? Those types of things. And I'll start, I'm gonna start again with Russell just because it's been long since he spoke. For I've only been doing the uh, training apprentices for a, a short time. So one of the things I've observed, we need to be supporting the schools because when you have a young person come in that has not been through school, um, they do not understand the principles. If you do not understand the principles of how a vehicle works, you cannot fix it. You need to understand um, what makes it work. You need to understand why it's doing what it's doing. And therefore, if if you've got one that the, let's say you've got something that the um, it's making a clicking noise. If you don't understand the, the whole uh, suck blow or suck uh, squeeze bang blow, um, you've got a noise here, but you, you don't understand the cycles of operation to be able to even identify that, hey, if I take the spark away then, and the noise goes away, then I know that it's related to a piston. But if I take the spark away and it's still clattering, then I know it's valve train. Um, if you don't have that understanding to begin with, then you're lost. You've got a noise. You have no clue how to diagnose. Um, so we, these guys or Gret gals, whoever they are, when they come in, they need to understand the theory of how it works. Um, so we as, uh, as dealers and as independents need to be supporting these schools. Let's send our senior techs in, let them visit with uh, the young people, talk to them a little bit, you know, whet their appetite, talk about some of the things you fix. Um, if you've got a young person and uh, you're telling stories about going into a transmission, taking it all apart and finding this busted seal um, and the kid's excited about it, you know, you got your next tra transmission tech, nurture him, bring him on, her on, whoever it happens to be and um, bring, train them. If you got somebody that just sits in the back with their arms crossed and doesn't don't want anything to do with it, then you know, hey, we can invest time in somebody else. That person's not interested. So um, it, it gives you a chance to, when you're in the schools, to um, pick up on those good kids and encourage them. Because as we fix some of the pay issues, this will be a great career field to be in. Absolutely. Marshall, how about you? Well, um, I mean, first off, I feel like uh, a lot of the companies out there, um, OEM dealerships and, and everything else and, and independent shops, they're really starting to see that this is uh, a route that they want to go, which is the mentorship, apprenticeship style, uh, grow your own tech route. Um, I feel like uh, they need to be up front with themselves and know that it's going to take a lot of work. It's it's a lot of work on their side. It's a lot of work on the mentor technicians side. And I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up a point that the mentor techs need to be trained also. Like you, not everybody has a natural skill for mentoring other people. And uh, we need to bring, we need to support that up with our senior techs and find the ones that want to do it and, um, and get them some training too on how to be a good mentor for these these young men and women that are coming into the field. Another thing is that we need to compensate them appropriately for putting in that extra effort. Um, they're not only valuable assets to us for the ability to fix things in the shop, but also their ability to train other people to be great technicians also. Um, you know, that ability that they add to their toolbox of knowledge, it's valuable. Um, and the technicians out there that are develop, developing themselves to be good mentors, technicians, that's a very marketable skill. And if you're a senior technician out there, you need to be thinking three years from now, this is going to be a, val a very valuable asset to have on your side when you're looking around for a position. Exactly. Very, very good. Robert, very I think Russell points. has a point. 
I'd like to add one thing to that sure. about the mentorship. If you can find and train a veteran, veterans are taught in the military to mentor. That's what, yep. what you know, junior leaders in the military do is we mentor our team. We train our team. We are taught to do that from very early on in the careers, which is a skill that can transition over into the civilian side very well. Absolutely. Great point. Agreed. Joshua, how about you? Uh, I have I have a, a fairly unique perspective because I had a great first shop foreman. That is like what I, you're I, here I, for. I, I had uh, I had the luxury of having a great shop foreman. There was five apprentices up here in Canada. We do things a little differently. Everything's got to be licensed. So you got to be a licensed and registered apprentice to be able to be even in the dealership. Really, um, back in the day, it was you know you could push a broom for a while and you can get away with it, but after a period of time, you had to be licensed or they'd come around and you get fined if they were working on stuff and you weren't registered. After that, you know, you could be changing oil for three years or you could be learning. And again, I luxury, my luxury was I had a foreman that once, maybe even twice a week, he'd take the five of us, give us a, the work order that he'd been working on that day, the drivability, the NVA, sorry, the NVH, whatever he was working on that he had hours in trying to figure out, he'd already solved it. He'd give us the work order and at five o'clock and say, figure it out. See you tomorrow. And the five of us be drinking, smoking, having coffee until 11, 12 at night, trying to figure it out. And the next morning he'd come in and say, so what was it? And we'd all tell him one answer and he'd say, nope. And here's why. That kind of stuff I have never seen again. Mm -hmm. And to that point, I tried to replicate that many years later. Once I got my flat, once I got my license, once I was red seal and I had the opportunity to have a spare bay, the, the co-op kids and, and the apprentices around me, I tried to emulate that. I wasn't the leader that he was, but I tried to emulate as best as I can. And it's hard. It's truly hard, but to have people in your shop, willing to put in that kind of effort and truly care about the result of these people, these young people learning, growing in this industry and doing well for the industry as a community, that's invaluable. And it needs to be, it needs to be part of everybody's conversation in this, not just getting into the schools. You know, we got to get in the schools. I, I understand. And I agree with all of you. We got to get in the schools. We got to get them young and we got to be having those conversations but we also really, really need to be having those conversations with the folks that got the 25 years, 30 years under the belt. Like it's that wisdom is leaving. That experience is leaving. Statistics say the average technician is somewhere in the neighborhood of 16 to 20 years, not 25, not 28, not 30. It's like 16 to 20 years, which means that retirement, that retirement slope is coming very, very fast. So we need all we can to keep that out of NBH. There's uh, definitely some attrition that's coming down the pike. Uh, I wrote an article a couple of years ago, and, and Ted was uh, nice enough to publish it on his website. And it was that that very thing. It was like, you know, there's a coming technician shortage, but how do you how do you navigate that? How do you fix it? And one of the things I've seen in my years is this almost disconnect of I think that they need to put out almost like a Shackleton's, um, you know, ad where it's going to be you're going to be cold and you're going to be tired and you may not come back and it might be death to you but this is something that, that can you know for someone who has a talent that can do it it can be a very good lucrative career just like russell was saying so it's like you know when i was growing up it was all the guys thought that if i could fix the cars i'll be cool and the chicks will like me and then the ladies were like well if i could fix the cars then you know a guy will, you know, look towards me or anything of those those matters, but it's never like that. Once you get in, it's not it's not vanity. It's it's hard work every day. It's learning. It's getting your degrees, getting your certifications, going through all of those things. So it could be terrible some days, and some days it could be awesome. Just like you know, Joshua was just saying about being able to to raise up and and to apprentice other people in this industry and show them the ropes and you know how to make money doing it. Um, and one of the other questions that, that I had was, um, the manufacturer support of dealers for both the above listed items. So dealer and aftermarket getting involved in teaching 
And the other thing was was that Russell that touched on was creating apprenticeships in the actual shop. So I think that if they can create apprenticeships in the shop where there's an actual program and every dealership and every independent I've ever been to does not do this. I've never seen this, and I think it should be back, is bringing at least one of their lead techs and paying them for apprenticing the younger guys that come into the shop. Russell, if you would, just touch back on that for us for a minute. GM actually has a couple of programs that they do that they support the dealers on. One of them is uh, for veterans, um, and then they have the ASEP program, which is for students, um, where they'll take students, run them through, get them their GM training, um, and then they work in the dealership. Uh, the other one for the, the veterans, um, it's uh, for transitioning. So they, they actually go and they do training. Um, my service leader is actually headed to uh, Fort Hood next week to meet with some of these um, young people and see if there's anyone that wants to come up here to the panhandle of Texas. Um, so there's a couple of different programs that, that GM at least is doing to support training. Um, as far That's, as mentorship yep. in the shop, um, they definitely, you know, you can come from the training background, but if you're not supported by the people, if you're just thrown to the wolves, you don't get the kind of results that you get if you have a supportive shop that's actually involved saying, you know, even like what, what uh, Joshua's leader was doing, where he was giving them one that he knew what was wrong with it and saying, figuring it out, you know, it, it, the person works hard, tries to figure it out, comes up with what they think it is. And then the leader comes in and says, well, this is actually what you should have done. And this is the result. You remember that, you know, exactly. So when you, when you earn it, um, when you try, you fail, but you don't get destroyed because the vehicle still gets fixed. Right. Even though it may take a little longer, it still gets fixed. Right. That's, the customer is still getting taken care of, but you get an opportunity to learn. I remember Marshall. spending hours doing diagnosis with him out in the road and learn all the little tidbits. Those things Noises. were the, absolutely I, invaluable. I love it. I love it. And Mar so, uh, Marshall and Russell, thank you for your service. I know Jeffrey said that in the, mm -hmm. the chat a little while ago. Um, by the way, uh, Kara, that looks that does look like West Texas up there behind uh, Russell. That's what I was wondering. Where where is that? Where is that back? Caprock, Caprock Canyon. That's where I'm from. Yeah. Yeah. That's so crazy. I've sent I sent Ted some pictures of me in that canyon actually. Oh wow. Cool. That, that's where they were. Very good. <laughs> wow. Wow. So there you go. Um, so Kara, this is probably one of the very best panels coming up at the Fixed Ops Roundtable Wild West. It's very captivating. Uh, the answers are amazing. These gentlemen are extremely uh, well-versed and eloquent on the topic, and nobody better than these uh, experts in the field. And uh, Robert, great job on moderating that panel. Did the whole thing front to back. And I tell you, I was compared to Johnny Carson right at the end, so you did a great job with that. So amazing. So Fix Stops Round Taylor, everybody. Uh, here's our speaker lineup coming up. Robert Stage is going to be moderating this panel of uh, experts. Uh, also with us is going to be Joshua Taylor. Joshua, I like that picture. Very strong. Uh, Russell Wickham is going to be there. And uh, Marshall Sheldon is going to be on the panel as well. You do not want to miss it. It is coming up in two weeks at the Fixed Ops Roundtable, the Wild West, and um, probably the very first of many uh, events that these gentlemen will be involved with. And uh, so, Kara, you got to sit in with me and, you know, like be flies on the wall with this amazing talent. I know. And, and honestly, it was amazing to get this perspective tonight. I'm not that I'm a technician, but being a young person in automotive, I love to hear people talking about mentorship. And I do realize that it's so important because I see it day to day at our dealership. So I'm so I'm so grateful that we're hyper focused on this tonight and hopefully in the future to come. All right. Everybody, Joshua, Robert, Marshall, Russell, thank you so much for tonight. Uh, 
Not enough time, Sean <laughs> Butler, right? So great stuff. Robert, some close, uh, closing thoughts? I'm just really happy to be here. I'm really happy that you guys had us on. Um, I do know that the, it's difficult sometimes to get technicians together and get them all into one spot. So I like being able to showcase these guys. I love it. Wonderful. Super. Hey, everybody, thank you so much tonight. Uh, great show. Great stuff. Uh, event is coming up in two weeks. If you haven't got your tickets uh, yet, uh, fixedopsroundtable.com. They're all complimentary. I would recommend signing up. Uh, get those tickets because you're going to get text updates. Uh, the event has really, really, Kara, taken off here uh, last couple of days. A lot of folks are enrolling, so it's going to be a very strong event. Uh, last or complimentary ticket, fixedopsroundtable.com. Four-day event. You are not going to want to miss it. You're not going to want to miss this panel. And we'll be announcing the agenda uh, this coming Sunday. It's going to be on fixedopsroundtable.com. So I'm looking forward to seeing that agenda as well. So um, It's going to be a mile long. I, I'm afraid so. And I think it transitions hard too, Kara. So. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you for um, Thanks, everyone. tonight, getting here. All of you wonderful technicians. And I can't wait to hear more on the Fixed Ops Roundtable of the Wild West. Well, then, Wednesday at 10. Thank you very much for having.